for today's sermon, we are talking about, about money. And so I want to show you the world's, or supposedly, the world's most expensive hamburger. You can get it right here in the United States in Las Vegas, Nevada, which probably isn't surprising, at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino, and you can get it for the low, low price of $5,000. Now, I happened to watch a video on this online where I found it, uh, and with the chef that makes this, that personally makes each one for you, and he will tell you at $5,000, it is a steal. It is a deal, folks, because the beef, it's like a third pound of a pound of beef, it, uh, that costs about $95 a pound. And then on top of the beef is uh, far guar, which is duck liver, something from a duck. Um, and that costs twenty or $45 a pound. And then on top of that is beluga caviar, which is an insane amount of money. And then it's cooked in this wine sauce, and the wine they use is $6,000 a bottle. And then you get the fancy potato things, whatever they are, off to the side. And then you get a glass of that $6,000 a bottle wine. So really, it's like a value meal if you're Warren Buffett, right? And you look at this and you think, or actually, I've been asking to see church. Anyone ever had it? Anyone? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, 0 for 3 now. Uh, but, you know, I know some of our folks go to Vegas, but there's going to Vegas and playing blackjack for $10, and then there's this. Uh, but it's a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a burger, right? You can go down to the hill and get a really good burger for a whole lot less money than $5,000. And we know there's so much more, so many better things you could spend that $5,000 on. Some of you probably remember when a house cost $5,000 or a car. And actually, a couple years ago, we bought a well for $5,000. Uh, we built a couple of these over in uh, Africa and provided water for a whole village for that same amount of money. And I don't bring that up to make us look good or, or to, to bang on rich people too much. But to make the point about one of the characters in our parable, the, the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man is how he is described. Very often in these parables I've said, you know, the characters, they're, they're, they're deeper than what we think. There's more to them than meets the eye. You know, there's, there's some redeeming qualities to them. There's nothing redeeming about this guy. And you get that from the very way in which he is described. Whenever Jesus or anyone in the Bible describes someone as just rich, no other description other than their wealth, you know that person isn't going to come out of the story looking good. When all that you have to your name is your own wealth, there's a lack of humanity there, a lack of, of something there uh, that makes him not quite right. And that is certainly true of this man. He is a rich man who is dressed in purple and fine linen. Now, you may not know, but purple was the most expensive color back then. It's very hard to make, unlike today. And the fine linen that is used, that's the same language, the same wording that is used to describe the linens that the high priest wear when they go to serve at the temple. But instead of going and serving God in these clothing or in these, you know, almost royal robes, this guy uses them to eat dinner on Tuesday night. And he feasts sumptuously, uh, again, digging into the language a little bit, see, uh, uh, feast uh, rejoicingly and almost with music and, you know, with entertainment. So while we may reserve a band for a wedding or a 50th anniversary, this guy has music and entertainment each and every night. This guy is not just wealthy, he is conspicuously consuming his wealth. He is ostentatious. He is over the top. And he's over the top with what he spends on him. And then we have Lazarus, who gets a name, who we know more about than simply his status. He is outside the gates. And again, digging into the Greek just a little bit more, he is laying outside the gates, or quite literally, he has been tossed outside the gates. Maybe not by the rich guy, but maybe he's, he's put there by some friends hoping that he'll get some help. Or maybe he's just been metaphorically tossed aside by society. And he lays outside there, he's covered in sores, he's hungry, and he would just like some of the crumbs, some of the crumbs from the table, just a napkin full of, of crumbs. And yet he doesn't get that. All he gets are some dogs that lick his sores and provide him some sort of comfort. And then both men die. 
Lazarus dies and he goes to the bosom of Abraham, which is the Jewish uh, equivalent or the Jewish description of heaven. And uh, the rich man goes to Hades and is suffering. Right? And so the first become, or the last become first, and the first become last. And you would think, you would think that something would shake this rich guy, this guy up. Something would, would wake him up to what's going on here, but no. Because here's the problem. The problem isn't that just that he's wealthy. The problem isn't just that he's opulent and conspicuously consuming what he has. The problem is that he is totally blind to his neighbor. He's totally blind, but Lazarus exists. The Lazarus sits at his gate. And don't think of like a ranch gate that's a quarter mile from the house. Think of the gate outside of your little walled-in compound in the city. That's what we're talking about here. A guy he sees every day, but totally ignores him. And even in death, he only can see Lazarus as a servant. So he looks up and he sees Father Abraham. He says, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to get me some water to cool my tongue. At best, he can see Lazarus as someone made to serve him, as someone who's still there to do the rich man's bidding. He doesn't get that the tables have been flipped. And of course he gets denied, and, and um, uh, Abraham says there's this great chasm, it's no way to be done. But then he goes another step further, he says, okay, well then Father Abraham, since I can't do anything down here, can you send Lazarus to go and speak to my brothers? Because apparently there are five other rich jerks who aren't getting it. And if he tells them to shape up, then maybe they won't end up in the same spot as me. And Abraham says something interesting. He says, well, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. What he's really saying is they have the Torah, right? The first five books of the Bible. They have all the prophets and all their writings. They have the word of God. Maybe they should read it and listen to it. Because throughout the Old Testament, throughout the prophets, and the Torah, you have this, this encouragement, this admonishment, this command to care for the hungry and the sick who are there in your midst, right? Even in the laws, you don't glean, you don't uh, harvest till the ends of the fields. You leave that last row or so as a gleaning for the poor and the hungry. You don't spend all your money, you give some of it away. If someone comes asking for bread, you give it to them again and again and again and again. Trust me, it's there all over the place. You take care of the poor. You take care of the people in your midst. And Abraham says, you know, if they're not going to listen to that when it's right there in front of their face, they're not going to listen even if someone comes back from the dead. And of course, there's all sorts of foreshadowing there with Jesus, right? Jesus is going to come back from the dead. People aren't going to believe him either. So we have this problem of the rich guy who does not see his neighbor, even in death, doesn't recognize who Lazarus is supposed to be. Lazarus is not just a poor guy outside of his gate. Lazarus is a fellow child of God. Lazarus, in a sense, is supposed to be his brother uh, in the world. And he has some responsibility towards him. Now, none of us, as far as I know, are fabulously wealthy. At least not eating $5,000 hamburgers. But a lot of us are doing okay, right? I mean, we may not feast every day, but we've got more than enough food, and some of us aren't missing any meals at all. And we may not be wealthy and have tons of money in the bank, but comparatively, we're doing pretty good. You know, I'm, I'm middle class in the work I do, and um, I was doing some statistics online and looking up from multiple sources to try to get an average. And, and what it looks like is about two and a half billion people in the world live on $2.50 or less a day. And about a billion people live on a dollar or less a day. Or to put that another way, about a billion people live on $365 a year. <clears throat> Folks, my utility bill was higher than $365 last month. Actually, I had a water leak way over that. It's terrible. Anyways, relatively speaking, I'm loaded next to those people. And so there's a question and a challenge that comes to us, because you don't have to be fabulously wealthy to be blind to those around you. And the question is, do we see the Lazarus in our midst? Do we see the people who are suffering right in front of our eyes? And are we doing anything to care for them? Are we reaching out to them? 
Sometimes, you know, we clergy will get together, some of my friends will get together, and we'll talk about how much money is too much money. This is a particularly fun conversation for Lutheran clergy because we're never going to be rich, so it's an easy thing to talk about in the abstract. And so, you know, the question of, is there something inherently wrong with Jeff Bezos, who I think is the richest man in the world now, he owns Amazon, uh, worth over $100 billion. Is there something inherently evil about Apple Incorporated, our favorite phone maker, uh, the company that is now worth over a trillion dollars, the first private company ever to be worth so much? And we'll go back and forth a bit, and some people say, yeah, there's a line, some people say, no, there's a line. And here's where I kind of fall upon it. I'm also a fan of Bruce Springsteen, uh, who's a songwriter, rock and roller, and he wrote this song back in the early 90s called Youngstown, which is actually uh, about Youngstown, Ohio, where my wife grew up, and about the fall of the steel industry there in the 70s and 80s. And in the song, which I'm not going to try to sing for you, but in the song there's this line, which is just great, about this steel worker talking uh, to the people who are closing the steel plant, and he says, you know, we've made 700 tons of metal a day, and now you tell me the world's changed once I've made you rich enough, rich enough to forget my name. And when we talk about how wealthy is too wealthy, maybe it's too wealthy when we forget the names of the people around us. Maybe it's too wealthy when we start to dehumanize people to the point where they're no longer our neighbor, they're no longer our brother and sister, they're just a statistic. They're just a nameless face in the crowd. They're just the poor and the suffering instead of people with actual names and stories that we know. See, I think the challenge for us is we are called to care for those in need. We're called to care for the Lazarus in our midst who are suffering and who are hurting and who are right there, right outside of our gate, right in our faces, and we often just walk right on by. And when I say we need to care for them, I think it's more than just doing charity. And don't get me wrong, charity is absolutely great, right? It is wonderful, the amount that this church gives to so many different charities and ministries around the world. It is wonderful, the charity we're showing by giving away uh, the school supplies and the backpacks to the kids who need them. But I think Je Jesus challenges us to go a step further, especially with our closest neighbors, to form some sort of relationship. We're called to, to cross that chasm in our world, not the great chasm between heaven and hell, but the chasm between the rich and the poor, or just the middle class and the poor, or between ourselves and those people who we'd rather keep at arm's length. We're called to show the similar sort of compassion that the dog shows in this parable. Because let's be honest, the dog is sort of the kindest person in this story. Right? They at least go up and, and provide some sort of comfort. We don't have to get that up, up close and personal. Don't take that too literally. But at least the dogs know who Lazarus is. At least they are friends to him. At least they know his suffering and his pain. And they do what they can to help him as an individual. Do we do the same? And listen, I know we can't, you know, save all the children of the world, and we can't be friends with everyone around us, but we just know someone who's actually poor, who's actually on the edge. Do we care about them as an individual and as a person, not as a statistic, but as an actual person? That's Austin County, if you didn't recognize it. In our county, about 14.5% of people live below the poverty line. That's not too bad, actually. That's about the national average. Do we know any of them? Can we put a name to any of that, any of those people in that statistic? I think that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to have that relationship where we recognize who those people are. They're not just the poor. They're not just the hurting. They're not just charity cases. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are our extended family that we find in God. And part of our calling is, a, is to put a name to those faces. Part of our calling is to put a story to those statistics. Part of our calling is to not just reach out with our wallet, and that's a good thing to do, but to reach out with our hearts and our time and our energy as well. I'm not sure what form that takes for you. I'm not telling you there's one way to do it. I'm not telling you you have to adopt a poor person and bring them into your house. But I do think we are challenged to reach out and to show them some humanity. And in doing so, 
we can show some humanity we have within ourselves. Jesus tells us, don't store up treasures on this earth where moth is, moths are going to get to them and rust is going to eat them. Don't store up treasures in this world that are going to break down and fall apart and be worthless tomorrow. Store up your treasures in heaven. And at least part of the way we do that, folks, is by giving some of the treasure we have on earth here away. It's about reaching out to those in need and sharing what we have with them. To make sure that the crumbs from our table go to those who are starving. And to make sure that some of the love from our hearts go to those who are alone. And so may we continue to be challenged to see those who are at our gates, who have been cast off by society. And may we continue to be willing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and go beyond the charity cases and be willing to know people as our brothers and our sisters in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.